Hello, hello. I am so glad we are here again for video lesson 12, SPM Bible Knowledge. Are we ready for last week's memory verse? That's right. We took our memory verse from chapter 8, verse 21 of the book of Luke, didn't we? Now, I hope you have memorized the verse well, because I'm going to give you four statements here, and I want you to take half a minute to read through the four statements, and then tell me which of the statements is Luke chapter 8, verse 21. Are you reading now? Good. All right, have you chosen? Would one of you like to say which statement is the correct rendering of Luke chapter 8, verse 21? That's right. Number four is the correct statement. Jesus said to them all, My mother and brothers are those who hear the word of God and obey it. That is the definition of a new family relationship, isn't it? And in many ways, it is true. Because when I went to church, I became very close to many of the church members. And there were two older people than I to whom I looked up. And they really played the role of mother and father in my life. Jesus said to them all, my mother and brothers are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Luke chapter 8 verse 21. Now have you got your notebooks with your home assignment completed? Bring them out and bring a red pen with you to mark them. Are we ready? Your first question in the home assignment was, when the Pharisee saw this, he said to himself, if this man really were a prophet, he would know who this woman is who is touching him. He would know what kind of sinful life she lives. Luke chapter 7 Verse 39. Question 1. What is the name of this Pharisee? That is right. The name of the Pharisee was Simon. Question 2. What did the woman do for Jesus? Yes. From verses 37 to 38 and 44 to 46, we read, that the woman brought an alabaster jar full of perfume and she stood behind Jesus by his feet, crying and wetting his feet with her tears. Then she dried his feet with her hair and she kissed them. And finally she poured the perfume on them. Did you get this right? Well done. Over to question number three. What did the Pharisee not do for Jesus? Oh yes, as the host who had invited Jesus to his house, he was very negligent in his hospitality duties towards Jesus, wasn't he? What did he not do for Jesus? That's right. From verses 44 to 46, Jesus told Simon, 
that he had not given Jesus any water for Jesus to wash his feet. He did not welcome Jesus with a kiss and he did not provide olive oil to anoint Jesus' head. Oh dear, what a terrible, negligent welcome he gave to Jesus. What did Jesus say about the woman to Simon? Chapter 7 verse 47 tells us, Jesus said that the great love she has shown proved that her many sins have been forgiven. You see, when Simon said, if Jesus were a prophet, he would have known what a sinful woman this was. Now Jesus turned to Simon and said, Simon, yes, she may have had a sinful life, but now she is showing the forgiveness of sins that she has received. And she has shown the tremendous great love she has for me. Jesus said that the great love she has shown proved that her many sins have been forgiven. Now I hope you got all these answers correct. Shall we move on to question two? Once there was a man who went out to sow grain. As he scattered the seed in the field, some of it fell along the path where it was stepped on and the birds ate it up. Luke chapter 8 verse 5. Where did this statement come from? Yes, indeed, it came from the parable of the sower. Question 1. What did the seed represent in this parable? Does anybody have the answer? That's right. The seed represented the word of God. And so as the seed was sown in the field, so the word of God is being spread among the people. Question two. On what other types of ground did the seed fall? And what happened to the plants that grew from them? Have you got your answers? Are we ready? Here it comes. From chapter 8, verses 6 to 8a. Some of the seed fell on rocky ground. And when the plants sprouted, they dried up because the soil had no moisture. The soil was not very deep. It had no moisture. Secondly, some of the seed fell among thorn bushes, which grew up with the plants and choked them. So the plants did not have a chance to grow to maturity. And finally, some seeds fell in good soil. The plants grew and bore grain, 100 grains each. And that is the good soil, which represented the good and obedient heart, which hears the word of God and obeys it, and persists in obeying the word of God till they bear fruit. How wonderful. All right, now, are you ready for today's lesson? Let's take a look at the map of Israel at the time of Jesus. And this map shows Jesus' ministry in the district of Galilee, up in the northern part of Judea. And these towns, Capernaum, Cana, Nazareth, 
Nain are familiar to us, aren't they? Well, let us move on. Today's lesson comes from chapter 8, verse 22 to 56. And this passage covers three main sections. The first of which is Jesus calms a storm. Luke chapter 8, verse 22 to verse 25. The second section deals with Jesus heals a man with demons. In chapter 8, verses 26 to 39. And the third section deals with Jesus heals a sick woman and raises Jairus' daughter to life. From chapter 8, verse 40 to verse 56. Now, let us begin with Jesus calms a storm. Shall we look at the chapter? If you have your textbooks, please turn to chapter 8 and turn to verse 22. And I will read the verses as you listen and as you watch the pictures shown on the slides. One day, Jesus got into a boat with his disciples and said to them, Let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they started out. As they were sailing, Jesus fell asleep. Suddenly, a strong wind blew down on the lake, and the boat began to fill with water, so that they were all in great danger. Look at the boat being tossed to and fro by the waves. And there was Jesus, fast asleep. The disciples went to Jesus and woke him up, saying, Master, Master, we are about to die. Jesus got up and gave an order to the wind and to the stormy water. They quieted down and there was a great calm. Then Jesus said to the disciples, Where is your faith? But they were amazed and afraid and said to one another, Who is this man? He gives orders to the winds and waves and they obey him. I would like you at this point to take out your hand out three and I want us to consider some of the following points. Do you know that when Jesus asked, where is your faith? He did not say that the disciples were faithless, but he wondered why their faith had not shown itself during these circumstances, during these frightening times. Jesus asking them that question must have implied that they should have trusted him and not have given in to their fear. They had already witnessed Jesus' power over evil spirits, over sicknesses, over nature, and over death even. And could they not remember what answer Jesus gave to the disciples of John the Baptist? when they came to ask Jesus whether he was the one 
John had been preaching about or were they to look for another? Do you remember what Jesus did? Yes, Jesus did not answer their question orally at once. What did he do? He immediately performed miracles of healing. And he made the blind to see, and the deaf to hear, and the lame to walk. And he told them that even the dead were raised to life. And the poor had good news preached to them. And then he told John's disciples, Go back and tell your master, John the Baptist, what you have seen and what you have heard. And remind him that Isaiah the prophet had prophesied that when Messiah comes, he will be doing these miracles. Yes, tell John that I am the one who is to come. I am the one that he was prophesying about. Had the disciples of Jesus forgotten that incident so quickly? And was it logical that they gave in to their fear? It was their fear of the raging waves and the storm that beat upon them that made them wake Jesus up. Did they think that a mere storm could make the Messiah perish? When Messiah had come with God's plan to be implemented. Wow! Jesus asked them, Where is your faith? You should have trusted me. Nevertheless, I have shown you yet another miracle that I have authority over the winds and the waves even. And what do you think the answer to the disciples' question, who is this man, would be? In view of what Jesus had done, the only answer to this question would be that he is the very Son of God, because God's presence and power was clearly demonstrated in his actions. In witnessing such miracles, the disciples grew in their understanding of who Jesus is. Now, in verse 23, part A, it reads, As they were sailing, Jesus fell asleep. And then when he got up, he saw the situation. He didn't rebuke his disciples. He at once gave an order to the wind and to the stormy water. They quieted down and there was a great calm. Now, what do you think this incident shows about the nature of Jesus. What does his ability to calm the storm show about his power? That's right. The fact that Jesus slept through the storm shows his humanity. And the fact that the wind and the waves quieted down at his order shows his divinity coming from the word divine divine means belonging to god 
Divinity means Godship, being God. And so, this dual nature, dual means two, this dual nature of Jesus is why we call him the God-man. Now, can you remember one other incident that shows Jesus' humanity clearly? Do you remember? In Luke chapter 4, what had Jesus been doing? Yes, he had fasted in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And at the end of it, he was very hungry. And so in his temptation, after he had fasted 40 days, he was hungry. And the fact that he was hungry shows that he was human, fully man. I would like you to take out your hand out on miracles of Jesus given to you from a previous lesson. And I want you to take your pen and write down miracle number nine, Jesus calms a storm. The reference is Luke chapter 8, verses 22 to 25. Now, what is the lesson learned from this miracle? Jesus has power over creation over nature. He was able to calm the winds and the waves. This miracle showed his divinity. Have you written that sentence down? Write it down immediately. Secondly, Jesus exhibited his humanity because he was tired and he slept. Thirdly, a very important lesson that we learn is that he was the perfect God-man. Perfect God, perfect Son of God, who left heaven's glory to become man on earth, to show us God's heart of love. So he was the perfect God-man. Have you finished writing these three points of the lessons learned? All right, now I would like you to take out your handout one and I would like you to look at activity A. And I will give you two minutes to complete this activity. Can you fill in the blanks? in these sentences that are shown and then in question two mention another miracle involving nature and briefly describe it i will give you two minutes
Right, have you finished? Let us compare our answers. Luke chapter 8, verse 23. As they were sailing, Jesus fell asleep. This shows Jesus' humanity. Luke chapter 8, verse 24b, Jesus got up and gave an order to the wind and to the stormy water. They quieted down and there was a great calm. Jesus had authority over the forces of nature. It points to the fact that he must be the Son of God. This shows Jesus' divinity. This dual nature of Jesus is why we call him the God-Man. I hope you have filled in these six blanks correctly. Now let us move on to question two. Mention another miracle involving nature. Briefly describe it. Yes, the miracle was the huge catch of fish in Luke chapter 5 verses 1 to 11. And have you described it briefly? Here it is. When Simon and his partners John and James had fished all night and caught nothing, Jesus told them to push the boat into the deep water and let down their nets. To their amazement, they caught such a large number of fish that the nets almost broke. Did you get this description correct? Well done. Now, let us move on to activity B in the same handout. And I will give you two minutes to work through these two questions. Number one, are there times that you should have trusted him and not have given in to your fear? Number two, how will knowing that Jesus gave an order to the wind and to the stormy water, they quieted down and there was a great calm, help you now? Do you know that when I was the CEO of Methodist College Kuala Lumpur, one day, it was a Saturday, we had organized a big walkathon. And we were out in this park where we were going to have the walkathon. And as I drove from my house to this park, it began to drizzle. And I was so very fearful that we might have to cancel the whole event because when I looked up at the skies they were very dark with dark grey clouds and as I prayed and drove along suddenly the story of Jesus calming the storm came into my mind and I prayed, Dear Lord Jesus, you are the creator of the whole universe. You have control over the winds and the waves. You had the control on the Sea of Galilee. And I believe you have the control in Kuala Lumpur City today. Dear Lord Jesus, please send a strong wind 
to blow away these dark clouds and make the rain stop in time for us to open the incident in the park with glorious sunshine. And I drove on and reached the park, parked my car, got out and walked to the starting point. And as I walked to the starting point, I looked up at the skies and certainly there was a great wind that was blowing the grey clouds away. And so when the event began, I thanked the Lord for his very gracious answer to my prayer. And publicly, I prayed aloud and thanked God for clearing the storm and giving us a bright sunny day for our outdoors event. Jesus, the Son of God, is alive today and he sits at the right hand of God interceding for us. And I was so absolutely delighted and deeply humbled that he had answered my prayer. And so the next time when there is something that is causing you fear, remember this incident and pray to the Lord Jesus and ask him to overcome the circumstances. Are we ready to move on? Do you remember where Jesus was heading with the disciples when the storm came upon them in the middle of the Lake of Galilee? Yes, Jesus was sailing across the Lake of Galilee with his disciples to the opposite shore. And we will read an incident that took place there. Jesus heals a man with demons from Luke chapter 8, verse 26 to 39. And here is a map showing us the Sea of Galilee more clearly. Here is Capernaum and Jesus and his 12 disciples had left Capernaum and they were going to sail across the Sea of Galilee to the region opposite Capernaum, to Gergesa or to the land of the Gerasenes. In verse 26, Jesus and his disciples sailed on over to the territory of Gerasa. From the name Gerasa comes the Gerasenes, the people who lived in Gerasa, this area here. Jesus and his disciples sailed on over to the territory of Gerasa, which is across the lake from Galilee. Gerasa is a predominantly Gentile area on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. All right? And what happened? In your textbooks, in verse 27, we read these words. Shall we look at the text? As Jesus stepped ashore, 
he was met by a man from the town who had demons in him. For a long time, this man had gone without clothes and would not stay at home, but spend his time in the burial caves. My goodness, this man here had demons in him, which had caused him to go naked without clothes, and which had caused him to leave home and he would go to the place where they buried the dead people and he lived in the burial caves. Verse 28 says this, When he saw Jesus, he gave a loud cry, threw himself down at his feet and shouted, Jesus, Son of the Most High God, what do you want with me? I beg you, don't punish me. What did this man filled with demons call Jesus? Jesus, son of the most high God. Wow. This demoniac, demoniac, is a person filled with demons. He gave the answer to the question that the disciples asked in the boat, didn't he? They asked, what kind of man is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? This demoniac knew Jesus as son of the most Hi, God. And he trembled. He was frightened. And he asked Jesus, What do you want to do with me? I beg you, don't punish me. He said this because Jesus had ordered the evil spirit to go out of him. Many times, it had seized him, and even though he was kept a prisoner, his hands and feet tied with chains, he would break the chains and be driven by the demon out into the desert. My goodness, this evil spirit had given this man such tremendous physical strength, that he was able to break chains as strong as these ones shown in the picture here. And he would leave the chains behind and run away from home and live amongst the tombs. And Jesus had asked him, what is your name? And he had cried out, My name is Mob. He answered, Because many demons had gone into him. Do you know that the older versions of the Bible gives his answer as, My name is Legion. The demons had taken a term. The term legion in the Roman army means an army of 6,000 soldiers. You see, the demons had taken control of this man. He didn't give a normal answer of my name is Simon or Andrew or James or John. He said, my name is Mob. What does Mob mean? Mob means a very large crowd of people. The demons, a whole 
troop of demons had taken control of this man. And although Jesus asked the man his name, it was the demons who replied, showing that they were in control of the man. Verse 31, the demons begged Jesus not to send them into the abyss. Now, what is the abyss? In the Bible, abyss refers to the place where demons are confined. The Greek word for abyss means bottomless or very deep. Verse 32, there was a large herd of pigs nearby feeding on a hillside. So the demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs and he let them. And as soon as the demons went out of the man and into the pigs, the whole herd rushed down the side of the cliff into the lake and was drowned. And I think it is in Mark's Gospel which tells us that in this herd there was about 2,000 swine. It was a very large herd of swine that rushed down the slope into the Lake of Galilee and they were all drowned. And what do you think happened to the demons? They had thought that by Jesus letting them go into the swine of pigs, they would then not be sent into the abyss. Now, when the swine drowned, where do you think the evil spirits went? Of course, they had to go to the abyss where they would be confined and not allowed to come out to disturb another human being. You see, whenever evil spirits invade a person's life, invade a physical body, they cause confusion. And when they went into this herd of pigs on the hill slope, the pigs became totally confused and began running to and fro. And what better way to go than to go downhill? And they rushed downhill and were drowned. Verse 34. Imagine the herders, the men who had been taking care of the pigs, saw what happened. So they ran off and spread the news in the town and among the farms. And the people went out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were all afraid. My goodness, these people were not afraid when the man had run around their neighborhood shrieking, beating up people, breaking things until the people had to chain him up. Now that they come out and see that the demons had gone out of him and he is clothed and in his right mind and for a change he is sitting down calmly and quietly at the feet of Jesus. They were all afraid. Why do you think they were afraid? This man 
sitting at the feet of Jesus, indicated his submission to Jesus and his status now as a disciple, a learner at the feet of his teacher. So what were the people afraid of? Verse 36, those who had seen the miracle take place told the people how the man had been cured. Verse 37, then all the people from that territory asked Jesus to go away because they were terribly afraid. So Jesus got into the boat and left. When the people of the town and the farms heard that the swine, the herd of 2,000 swine had drowned, they were terribly afraid. So they said to Jesus, please leave us. We don't want you here. Of what were they all afraid? And of whom were they terribly afraid? Verse 38. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged Jesus, Let me go with you. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Go back home and tell what God has done for you. The man obeyed Jesus. He went back home. He went back through the town, telling what Jesus had done for him. And you can see the man in this picture very sadly turning away from Jesus. He wanted so much to be with Jesus, the only place where he had found sanity and peace and calm in his soul. But Jesus refused him that privilege and gave him a new assignment. Jesus wanted him to go back home and tell his family what God had done for him. You see, Jesus himself had to leave that place because the people didn't want him there. So he had to send this man back home to do a work on Jesus' behalf. This man was to tell his family what God had done for him and bless him. He didn't just tell his family. He went back throughout the whole town and throughout the whole country of the Gerasenes and he told everyone the wonderful miracle that Jesus had performed for him. Wow! What a tremendous healing. I want you to take out your hand out on miracles of Jesus and jot down this tenth miracle. Have you got your pen and chart on miracles of Jesus now? Write down number 10. Jesus heals a man with demons. Reference Luke chapter 8 verse 26 to 39. And what is the lesson that we have learned from this miracle? Jesus has power over the evil one. In fact, he has power over this mob of demons. 
and Jesus sent the man home to his family. And within this big miracle is contained another miracle, miracle number 11, the destruction of the large herd of pigs from chapter 8 verse 32 to verse 37. And what is the lesson we learn from this destruction of the large herd of pigs? Where the men, the pig herders, could not control the stampeding of the pigs, Jesus was able to cast out the evil spirits from the pigs. After the pigs had drowned in the lake of Galilee. So Jesus has authority over this mob of evil spirits. Now have you written these sentences down? I'll give you five seconds more to just write down these sentences. Now, before we do activity C in handout one, I would like you also to have your handout three with you. And I want you to look at these points which I have printed in handout three for you. Before the demon possessed man had been alienated from his home and city. Where did he go to live? How did he dress? When he was demon possessed, he was naked, wasn't he? And he lived among the burial caves. He lived amongst the tombs of dead men. He had been separated, alienated, from his home and city. Now Jesus sends him back to his home. Jesus returned him to his home and gave him a fresh assignment. What did Jesus ask him to do? He was to have a share in Jesus' ministry by telling the story of God's mighty acts on his behalf. He was to tell his family and his people the tremendous act of healing that Jesus had performed on him. Another fact is we learn that demons can inhabit humans and even animals, but they have to bow to the authority of Jesus. They have to obey Jesus when Jesus orders them to leave the human being. And they had to get Jesus' permission to enter the swine on the hillside. And what do we learn about the local people in the region of Gerasa? We learn that the loss of a herd of about 2,000 pigs meant more to the local people in this Gentile area than the deliverance of this man from demons. Yes, the people were afraid of Jesus who had caused the destruction of the herd of swine. The loss of these pigs meant more to them than the deliverance of this man from demons. And thirdly, the people therefore rejected Jesus 
for economic reasons. And Jesus departed from them at their request. Because the people were not possessed by demons when they asked Jesus to leave them. They were in their sane minds and as they pondered, my goodness, what will this Jesus do if he comes into our society? Is he going to cause us further financial loss? Oh no, we better ask him to leave us. You see, the eastern side of Galilee was predominantly Gentile in population. And they didn't want this Jewish man coming to cause them further distress. So they asked Jesus to leave them. Now, let us take a look at activity C in handout one. What do these lessons have to do with me? What is one story of God's mighty acts that you can tell others on Jesus' behalf? How was the man's life changed by Jesus' act of deliverance of him from the evil spirits? Wasn't that a story of God's mighty act? Oh, yes. Has God performed a mighty act for you? In your life? Do you have a story to tell others? I will give you a little bit of time to think through what is God's mighty act on your behalf. All right, you have one minute more to write it down. Shall we move on? So Jesus got back into the boat and they left Garasa to go back to the other side of the Lake of Galilee. And they went back to Capernaum. And now we have the story of Jesus healing a sick woman and raising Jairus' daughter to life. Luke chapter 8, verses 40 to 56.
Let us read this story together. Chapter 8, verse 40. When Jesus returned to the other side of the lake, the people welcomed him because they had all been waiting for him. Then a man named Jairus arrived. He was an official in the local synagogue. In the older versions, it tells us he was a ruler of the synagogue. And as a ruler or an official in the synagogue, he had certain duties to perform. He would have to arrange for a schedule of people who would lead the devotions in the synagogue and he would have to see that the synagogue was tidied up and cleared for the service. He was a leader in the community. And this man was desperate for Jesus' help. What did Jairus do when he met Jesus? Jairus threw himself down at Jesus' feet and begged him to go to his home because his only daughter, who was 12 years old, was dying. Oh dear, this poor man had an only child, his only daughter, and he had loved her for 12 years, and now she was dying. Oh, I have heard that Jesus was able to raise a young man in the town of Nain. Maybe he can help me. And this ruler of the synagogue forgot all about Jesus being a peasant and he fell down at his feet and begged him to go to his home. Jesus agreed. As Jesus went along, the people were crowding him from every side. And now at this point, I want you to read verses 42b to 48 on your own quietly and then I want you to look at these pictures on this slide and I want you to take out handout one and look at activity D where you are told to read chapter 8 verse 42b to 48 silently and then you are to match the narratives to the correct picture. So these are the narratives which you have in activity 1D. All right, have you got handout 1 ready? And you have found the four boxes of narratives. Now I will show you the pictures again. And I want you to match the number against the picture with the box containing the narrative that describes this picture. Right, you have one and a half minutes to do that now.
Now, have you finished? Let us take a look at the answer. That's right. The first picture, number one, is shown here against the second box in the against the box on the right hand column as jesus went along the people were crowding him from every side among them was a woman who had suffered from severe bleeding for 12 years she had spent all she had on doctors but no one had been able to cure her for how long had she been ill how long had she been suffering this severe bleeding for 12 years so she began suffering the year that Jairus daughter was born the second picture comes here number two she came up in the crowd behind Jesus and touched the edge of his garment, of his cloak, and her bleeding stopped at once. Wow! Jesus' power flowed out from him into her and cured her at once. Number three, the third picture goes against this box. Jesus asked, who touched me? Everyone denied it. And Peter said, Master, the people are all around you and crowding in on you. And you are asking, who touched you? But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I knew it when power went out of me. The fourth picture goes against the first box. The woman saw that she had been found out. So she came trembling and threw herself at Jesus' feet. There in front of everybody, she told him why she had touched him and how she had been healed at once. Jesus said to her, my daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Wow! Jesus called her my daughter. My daughter. How tenderly Jesus addressed her. Please take out your handout three. Let us consider these points together. The woman's bleeding had rendered her ritually unclean all the time, so that she probably lived in isolation from her community for 12 years. You see, according to the book of Leviticus, a woman who is bleeding is considered unclean according to Jewish law. So she had become ritually unclean for 12 years. Not only did she live in isolation from her community, she wouldn't have been allowed to go to the temple to worship. She wouldn't have been allowed to go to a restaurant, to sit on a chair, and then other visitors coming in after her sits on the chair would become unclean. She wouldn't have been allowed to sit on a park bench because she would have made the bench unclean and other people sitting on it would have become unclean. So she had to live in isolation from her society, from her community. She must also 
have become materially poor because she had seen doctors for all these years, for 12 years, and not a single one of them could do anything for her. So she spent all her money, all her savings on seeing these doctors. And this is the story of her determination to cross all barriers in order to be healed and God rewarded her faith. Imagine how she would have had to push her way through the crowd, covering her head so that people would not recognize her. She was determined to get right up behind Jesus and just quietly touch the tassels that hung from the end of her clo his cloak. She was determined she would reach him and touch his cloak. She showed tremendous faith in the Lord Jesus. The woman wanted to go unnoticed because of the embarrassment of her illness and her act of breaking the ritual laws by touching Jesus' cloak. What would she have made Jesus become by touching him? Yes, under normal circumstances, Jesus would have become ritually unclean because she had touched his cloak. But did Jesus become unclean? Not at all, because Jesus communicated the power of cleansing to her and she was healed of her disease. And she didn't want to let the townspeople know that she was there because they would get angry with her. If she had touched them, they would have become unclean. But what did Jesus do? Jesus stopped the whole crowd and asked in a loud voice, who touched me? And Peter, before he could think, said, Jesus, why are you asking us this? Everybody is crowding around you. People are jabbing you with their hands, with their wrists, with their, with their elbows. How can you ask us this question? How did Jesus answer? I know that someone touched me because power went forth from me to heal. So Jesus forced the woman to make a public confession. And in doing that, Jesus would be ensuring that her healing would now be known to all and she could therefore be accepted back into the social and religious life of the community. As she came forward to bow down before Jesus, to bow down in front of him and to confess that she was the one who touched him, she would have thrown back her shawl that probably covered her face. And everybody recognized her because she had been sick for 12 years. And all her neighbors knew that she had been very sick. And now, publicly, Jesus made known to everybody that she was healed. So she would be accepted back into the community and she would be able to go to the temple 
to give thanks to God. Jesus also wanted to show the woman that it was her faith in Jesus that healed her, not her touch. It was not a superstitious belief in that the tassels of his cloak could have healed her. Not at all. It was her faith in Jesus that healed her. So Jesus addressed her tenderly as daughter. His heart must have been touched by all that she had gone through. He now embraced her within the family of God by referring to her as daughter, thus extending kinship to her and restoring her to a larger family of God. How wonderfully compassionate Jesus was to this woman. Do you remember the woman in Simon the Pharisee's house, how she also touched Jesus. And Jesus knew that her touch was due to her pouring her love on him in wanting to anoint his feet with the perfume. Here, this woman had touched Jesus' cloak in faith and Jesus knew because power had gone forth from him to heal her. What a wonderful public confession this was. The woman was able to stand up tall after Jesus had called her my daughter. She was able to hold her head high and walk back home through the crowds and be able to go to public places with her family. Now I want you to take out your handout on miracles of Jesus and put down miracle number 12. Jesus heals a woman with severe bleeding. Luke chapter 8 verse 42b to 48. Have you written that down? All right. What is the lesson learned from this? Jesus has power over sickness. And the woman had much faith to hope for healing by just touching Jesus' cloak. Have you written that down? Are we ready to move on? Now, can you remember why Jesus was going with this big crowd and who was going with him? Yes, Jairus was going with Jesus. Jesus was actually on the way to Jairus' house when this woman stopped him. And in verse 49 of chapter 8, when Jesus was speaking with the woman, a messenger came from the official's house, from Jairus' house. Your daughter has died. He told Jairus, don't bother the teacher any longer. How Jairus' heart sank. But you know, Jesus overheard it. Jesus heard it and said to Jairus, don't be afraid, only believe and she will be well. Do you remember the healing of the centurion's servant? How the centurion sent friends to Jesus with the message, 
don't trouble yourself to come to my house. Now that was said in great faith because the centurion believed that Jesus could heal from a distance. But here this messenger from Jairus' house said, don't bother the teacher any longer. Your daughter is past the time when he can do anything to help her. This was a test of Jairus' faith in Jesus. And to spare Jairus from losing his faith, Jesus quickly said to Jairus, Don't be afraid. Keep on trusting me. Only believe, and your daughter will be well. So Jesus went with Jairus and his disciples to the house. In verse 51, when he arrived at the house, he would not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John and James and the child's father and mother. And everyone there was crying and mourning for the child. Mourning. Look at this word, mourning for the child. When someone dies in our family, we mourn for the dead person. We weep and we cry. So everyone was there crying and mourning for the child. And what did Jesus say? He said, don't cry. The child is not dead. She is only sleeping. How did the people react? They made fun of him because they knew that she was dead. You know, I tremble whenever I read this line. They all made fun of him. They didn't know that Jesus was their creator God. They dared to laugh at him, make fun of him, at what he said. They laughed because they thought they knew better. In fact, they did know that Jairus' daughter had already died. But what view of death is Jesus giving us here? Jesus is telling us that the child is not dead. She is only sleeping. And since the death of Jesus on the cross of Calvary, and since his resurrection and his ascension into heaven, the Christian church has learned that dying on earth for us as Christians is merely falling asleep and waking up in heaven. And isn't that a wonderful way to consider death? Oh, let us be careful. Now, shall we look at verse 54? Jesus went in to the room where the little girl was lying and he took only Peter, James and John with him and the little girl's parents. And Jesus took the little girl by the hand and called out, Get up, child! And her life returned, and she got up at once, and Jesus ordered them to give her something to eat. Wow! And her parents were astounded. But Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone what had happened happened. Oh, my goodness. 
Do you think they would have been able to obey that command of Jesus? Why do you think Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone what had happened? How is it possible? Oh dear. But they were so absolutely delighted that their little girl had got up at once and she was able to run to mummy and hug her. My, what a tremendous miracle. For the second time, Jesus had demonstrated his power over death. Now take your hand out three and let us go over these points. Jesus' response to the messenger who came from Jairus' house to tell Jairus that his daughter had died. Jesus' response was to point out to Jairus that fear must give way to faith that recognizes who Jesus is and trusts that he is able to bring about the miraculous. All right, notice here Jesus insists on ignoring what the messenger said to Jairus. The messenger had said, don't trouble the master anymore. Whereas in the Roman officer's case, when his servant was almost dying, what did Jesus do? Jesus agreed with the friends who had come to him with that message, don't trouble the teacher anymore. And Jesus was able to heal the Roman officer's servant from a distance. Couldn't Jesus heal Jairus' daughter from a distance here? Of course, Jesus could have raised the little girl to life again, even from where he was standing. But he decided to tell Jairus not to lose faith, to keep on trusting in Jesus and all will be well. So they walked on the remaining distance to the house. And Jairus was holding in his heart, Oh, I must trust Jesus. He said that all will be well. And so Jairus' faith continued as he continued to walk with Jesus back home. And notice, after Jesus raised the little girl to life again, he cared for the girl's physical needs. He knew that the child had been ill for a long time and probably had not eaten. And he asked her parents to give her something to eat. That was also a practical thing to do for the parents who were so overcome with joy that their little girl had come back to life. That when they had to run to the kitchen and look for some food for her, it was some practical work for them to do. Do you know, I sensed this when my mother died. And after the burial ceremony, 
I went home and I looked at the empty kitchen and the empty house. And I went to the kitchen and I took out all the pots and pans which had some mark on them. And I scrubbed and scrubbed and scrubbed the pans till they were shining. I had to do something practical to lift my heart from sinking into depression. Jesus raised the little girl to life by just holding her hand and calling her to get up and she became alive again. No other magic, no other incantations. Jesus just held her hand and said, little girl, I tell you, get up. And she was able to get up. Wow. Now, I want you to take out your handout on miracles and write down this 13th miracle. Jesus raises Jairus' daughter to life. Luke chapter 8, verse 40 to verse 56. Are you ready for the lesson learned? Jesus has power over death. Jesus is not afraid of dead bodies. He is able to raise them to life. Jesus has power over death. And why do you think Jesus commanded her parents not to tell anyone what had happened? Look at your handout one, activity E. Ponder and think about this. Why did Jesus command them not to tell anyone what had happened? Are you ready for the answer? Why do you think Jesus gave that command? Jesus did not want more publicity about the miracles he was performing, especially this one of raising from the dead. This would have hindered his ministry because again, Crowds would seek him out for the wrong reasons. Jesus already had crowds following him. And he wanted the parents to keep the raising of their daughter from the dead a secret. But like I asked you before, do you think that was possible. The professional mourners and the neighbours who had been crying outside the house would have known what had happened when they saw the little girl walk out of the house. So this was one command that could not be obeyed. All right? Now, what else do we have left to do? Yes, of course, we have come to the end of our third incident and now it is time for our memory verse. Now, before we read this memory verse, what are the three incidents we have studied today? Yes, the first one was Jesus calms a storm. The second one was Jesus delivers a man from evil spirits. And the third one was Jesus heals a woman who had been sick for 12 years and raises Jairus' daughter back to life. Now these are three wonderful miracles, aren't they? So the memory verse is from chapter 8, verse 39. 
Let us read it together. Jesus said, go back home and tell what God has done for you. The man went through the town telling what Jesus had done for him. Can you learn this off by heart and be ready next week to recite it? And here is your home assignment. Two questions. One on the miracle of Jesus calming the storm and the second one on the woman touching Jesus' garment. All right, go home and write the answers out in your notebook. Now, let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for these three accounts that we have just learned. How you have power over nature. Lord Jesus, when you were on earth, you showed your great power over creation. And I thank you that you have shown it to me as well, that today you still have that power over nature. And then, you showed us how you had power over a mob of evil spirits and you cast them out of this man. And thirdly, you showed how you had power over both sickness and death and how you restored that poor woman who had suffered for 12 years. You restored her to her community and then how you raised this little girl to life once again. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for having come to earth to show us how much God loves us each one. And dear Lord Jesus, help us today to give ourselves to you, knowing that you love us so dearly. Help us to learn to love you with every ounce of our energy and enable us to learn the memory verse and to do the home assignment and come back next week for the next lesson. Thank you, dear Lord Jesus. In your own name we pray. Amen. We will see you next week where we will, when we will study the story of Jesus sending out the mission of the 12 disciples and the feeding of the 5,000, after which they had 12 baskets full of leftovers, which the disciples picked up from the picnic and other accounts. All right. Bye. See you next week. <laughs>